by uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, Labour MP for Islington. However, we also are very pleased to welcome uh, another uh, colleague on the platform here, who is Ernie Roberts, Labour Party member, uh, ex Assistant General Secretary of the um, AEU, and ex Labour MP for Hackney North during 1979 to 1987. So, very pleased to welcome him. <laughs> So who speaks first of uh, either Jeremy or Ernie, it rather depends on the parking situation at the moment, I'm So, um, we also want to have uh, plenty of discussion and uh, you know, people should feel free to uh, raise questions or anything they'd like to say to contribute to the debate. And there will be people walking up and down the aisles with little slips of paper. And if you want to uh, ask questions or make a contribution, fill in one of those slips and they'll be passed up to me here. And uh, so I think without more ado, uh, I'd like to welcome Duncan Hallett to open the meeting. Don Reyes, it is a bit rough on your phone to start the debate with you today. The one directly involved, of course, the EU, 
I keep changing his name, never mind. Uh, old fashioned, I can't, I can't keep up with the changes. The, the fact is, it's right wing control union, yes, but I'm on. Who's the man in Scotland in charge of the operations? Why, Jimmy Abbey, who was, people won't remember, a leader of the UCS and so on, long standing left in the AU, etc., etc. All these people, whatever they say in words, are not in reality the left. So it's absurd to talk about strategy in terms of collaboration with these people because they're on the other side. But what I do is, look, I am not equating the trading in bureaucracy of even the Labour Party's leaders with the boss class proper, with the Tory party or anything of that sort. No, no, no. They're an alternative, but they're an alternative in terms of growing capitalism. So to the left. Broadly speaking, there have been and there are two basic ideas about how the left can gain influence, how the left can transform the situation. First thing, first one is the obvious one. Here you have the party, the Labour Party, which used to claim, it's not too keen on the Labour Party now, used to claim to be a party of the working class. Uh, the left in the Labour Party was always keen on that formulation of the right, by the way, always. But nevertheless, any theory, etc., etc., was entirely willing. And the days when he was, you know, the flight and so on, to argue, oh, he's a right-wing bastard. Yes, he would talk about. He would talk about the interests of working people and so on. Famous speech, election speech from the 70s. We will squeeze the rich till the pit. That's kind of easy. That's the right wing, hard right wing of the Labour Party. Okay. Nevertheless, the argument of many people is that you have to transform this party. Why do you have to transform it? Well, you have to transform it well, again, well, obviously. But I mean, why this road? Because it is the traditional party of the British working class. Now, about this, I think we have to say two things. Well, you know, in policy terms, it is not easy now to distinguish it from the Tory party. I mean, I take an issue which someone might say is trivial, but it's a pretty big incident. You know, the Police Federation had a conference. I saw it in the Tory party. And uh, who was the guest speaker? One of the guest speakers. Why? Conway Blair. <laughs> now, at this time, there was an argument about whether or not the British police should be provided with longer, better battles to bash people with. <laughs> there was. And the Tory Home Secretary, who has never claimed any kind of left wing uh, credentials at all, thought this isn't really a very good idea. You know, we don't want Rodney King type incidents, especially we don't want them all <laughs> Now, Police Federation, not surprisingly, it's not really like this. Conrad Blair, in his address, on television, the whole rest, he says, yes, yes, in advance of the tourists, the police need to be provided with this equipment and so on. That's really interesting. There are far, far worse crimes and so on, but it is interesting. And since I don't have very long, I'll leave it at that and say that the Labour Party has never been a more right wing in my personal recollection, which goes back quite a long way. <laughs> it does, I mean, <laughs> oh, I'll tell you how that. The first general election of which I was conscious, and I was only conscious of it because I heard things on the radio, was 1935. Now, they have never been so right wing, so consistently right wing as they have now. But more important, from our point of view, the Labour left has never, within my recollection, been so relatively weak vis-a-vis -vis the right. Now look, we're talking about the politicians, we're talking about the people who are in the thing, uh, uh, Parliament, etc., etc. doesn't necessarily like the members, but then those members, which are our next item, are shrinking. Because I say so, nonsense. All the data I have comes from official Labour Party releases. There was one quite recently. Membership, now they claim, was 
253,000, of whom 80,000 were in a mess with their Jews. They don't say how far it is, I mean, many years of it in some cases, I don't know. But the fact is, that is a shrinkage. Uh, it's true that the days when they have more than a million members, nearly one million, one hundred thousand, in the fifties are long gone, and the membership has been shrinking over the years, and so on and so forth. But actually, in the recent period, if that figures are right, because they're claiming 300,000 in a few bits and bobs of the world, they have lost 50,000 members, paper members, in the last period. It's a shrinking organization. Now look, we must make a clear distinction between people who vote Labour and the Labour Party membership. Present time, if you can trust the polls, I don't, but still, at the present time, oh, the Labour vote has actually, the potential vote has actually increased. That's not the same thing at all, because there are various motives for voting Labour. I voted Labour yesterday in a municipal by-election. I have not the slightest confidence in the candidate as a full-time employee of Walworth Road Training Council, so he says he's left, so he has never met the comrade, uh, and he's an ordained minister of the Church of England. I'm a revolutionary socialist in the <laughs> But I voted for him against the Tories, and that, of course, is true of a very large part of the Labour Party's electoral base. The problem is, however, that the struggle inside the Labour Party, or, oh, as a fact, the struggle inside the unions too, one way or does not simply depend on what we argue, what we want, what they argue, and what they want. It depends on the actual level of the class struggle. That's the central thing. If we define the left as people who want a fundamental change in society, that's not going to be achieved by a minority of people, whether in Parliament, on the CUC, General Council, or what have you. It has to involve the activities, the actions, one way or another, large numbers of working people. And that means a higher level of class. Otherwise, you can't build effectively. It's bring it really to the key point, but I've got to make it diverge. You see, I describe the Labour Party as more right wing than that. Remember, you have to be quick, won't I? Uh, much more right wing than I can remember. But come on, you don't have to be all that old to remember when the Labour left was in the ascendancy. The early 80s, actually, from the end of the 70s, in the early 80s, the left was making the running. There's this famous election for deputy leader of the Labour Party. Uh, under the old system, I think. Oh no, 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 under the revised system, it was a conference decision, wasn't it? And Tony Benn ran against Dennis Peavy, the embodiment of hard right wing. You can say that he's always been an honest right winger, right? But a hard right winger. Ben lost, but he lost by a whisper. I forgot what the actual quote was. Come on. And he said that actually, if the delegacy of the Boilermakers Union, as it was then, had not been in the bar at the time, had been in the hall, and carried out their mandate, Ben would have won. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not only that, the whole series of changes. Labour councils, left Labour councils. Up and down the country, all over the place, remember Livingstone, the GLC, and so on and so forth. Now then, how did it go down? Well, you can say that political mistakes, that's a minor consideration actually. No, 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 no reason that the benefit of decline, decline, decline. Uh, of course, a lot of the ex uh, making career, uh, transferred their allegiances, didn't they? Not all at once, but you know, bit by bit by bit, they made their peace with Kinnett and now with Smith and so on and so forth, and many of them decorate the Labour Front bench. Others, well, there are others, are relatively isolated in the Labour Party nationally. 
The reason for that is quite simple. You look at the period of the ages, decade, working class defeats, factory, defeat of the steel workers, defeat of the miners, defeat of the railwaymen, etc., 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 Wapping, P&O, and all the rest of it. Now, working class defeat does not strengthen the left, it strengthens the right. Inevitably, it increases apathy, what can you do, etc., etc. That's the fundamental reason they <coughs> So what do you do in these circumstances? Now, I come to the basic point. You see, if you really want to change society, you've got to build an organization on the basis, not of people of the existing consciousness of the mass of the working class, but on the basis of socialist ideas, intervention in the class struggle, propaganda for socialism and so on and so forth. And for that you need certain kinds of instruments. First of all, you need an organization which is, in which your activities are not mainly devoted to fighting the right wing in your own party, but an organization which is able to look outwards to think of recruiting, of influencing ordinary people on their own estates, etc., etc. Secondly, it has to be an organization which not only fights in terms of ideas, but intervenes in each and every struggle that it can reach, each and every working class struggle. Uh, often unsuccessful. Often unsuccessful. But it does it because that and not what happens in Parliament is what is decisive. Let us take a recent example. The politics, absolutely iniquitous, right? Ah, let me declare, the Labour Party, of course, voted against it. At every stage in the House of Commons, yes, they did, they voted against it. Then, of course, the Tories had a majority, what happens? Well, quite a lot of people bought it. Uh, agree with the real fact. This is iniquitous and we're not having it. I.e. non payment. What was the position of the Labour Party? The position of the Labour Party nationally and even more important locally was well you have to accept the law, don't you? In other words, if that advice had actually been followed, we still have the poll tax with it. Wouldn't we? The whole thing is, it is working class struggle which is central to the development of the left, and for the left to develop effectively, it has to have an organization, big or small, I want to pick it, big or small. The problem is to convert the small one into a much bigger one, but you have to have that organization, that organization which is oriented on the class struggle, on socialist ideas, and above all of intervention. That's the only way of it. It's hard. It is hard. It's a hard struggle. We could bring through more than a decade of defeats. All of us, they would have to know. Yeah, you are. But, although it's a hard road, it's the only road that goes to the right place. You know the old biblical thing? Well, I used to know it anyway, some of I was educated. Uh, it broad is the way, yes, it give him extra time. Broad is the way, and <coughs> etc. Uh, that leads to destruction. <laughs> that leads to destruction. But narrow, narrow and steep is the path that leads to salvation. Well, the same thing is true of the struggle for socialism. <laughs> Thank uh-huh. you. 
thank you, Chair and Comrades. I do apologise for being late. I tried to do too much this morning and it wasn't all possible. So um, I was late arriving here and I apologise for that. And um, I do welcome the fact that Marxism 93 is being held and that there are so many debates on and uh, there is such a very large attendance at it. And I think you know, there is a, an important point in that in that there are large numbers of people who are not necessarily besotted by Guardian and independent editorials, that socialism is dead, that Marxism is long forgotten, and that ideas of collectivism are no longer relevant to our society. Uh, I do thank Duncan for his Christian socialist speech. He got, <laughs> he got the quote right in the end. <laughs> and um, whilst... Um, I can understand the point that he's trying to make about the organisational needs. I think there's also a need to seriously examine what has happened in the past 15 years, not just in this country. I was rather surprised that Duncan didn't mention very much of it, of what's happened in the rest of the world, in Europe and Eastern Europe, and the relationship between northern and southern countries. It's pretty clear that the left as a whole in Britain did decline quite heavily during the 80s because of a number of defeats that happened. The first of those defeats was the 1979 general election. And I must say I wasn't particularly surprised at the defeat of the Labour Party in the 79 general election. The simple reason that that Labour government uh, emphatically changed course three years earlier when it abandoned the economic strategy adopted in the uh, early 70s and went instead for a strategy imposed upon it by the, willingly imposed upon it by the International Monetary Fund, which instead of controlling incomes at the top end and raising tax at the top end, instead uh, um, tried to control wages at the lower end, and we ended up with the public sector strikes of 78 and 79, which I was heavily involved in. And it was obviously obvious to me that those people that had gone on strike in 78 and 79 against the Labour government weren't going on strike against the Labour government because they wanted a Tory government. They wanted a government that was prepared to stand up for their interests and redistribute wealth in favour of the working class. That meant that in the 1979 general election, that disillusionment led in some cases to abstention, in some cases to voting Tory, and, and that added up to a pretty heavy defeat for the Labour Party at that time. But it wasn't all a time of gloom around that period, if you remember it. There was the dramatic rise of the left in the Labour Party post that election defeat, because the sort of analysis that I offer is one that was pretty generally accepted around that time. There was also a growth of um, Communist and Labour Party equivalents throughout Europe, and that led to the Mitron victory in France in 1981. Sometime later, the victory of Gonzalez in Spain, Papandreou in Greece, and a number of others. What went wrong was, firstly, within the Labour Party in Britain, we lost um, we lost that deputy leadership battle, and the crucial turning point on the uh, the foot healing leadership, in my view was their appalling decision to support the Tory government over the Falklands War. A small number of us emphatically campaigned against the Falklands War as being the colonial struggle that it was. But it must be said, the popular and the popular, public campaign against the Falklands War was pretty small as well around the whole country. And it was a time of high jingoism and an awful lot of people who should have known better stayed at home and said it was awful instead of going down the, going down the streets to say it is awful and it's working class kids that are going to be killed in the Falklands conflict. The demise later of the uh, socialist government in France was again an economic one where they, instead of continuing the process of nationalisation of banks and some of the major industries and the process of redistribution, turned almost exactly 10 years later in the way that the uh, British Labour government had turned. And that too led to a demise of the left as a whole in France and gave space, I don't say it was the cause, it gave space to the growth of the fascists and the growth of the National Front in France. But in this country, a number of issues happened during the 80s which didn't help the cause of the left at all. Firstly, there was the inability, failure, cowardice, 
whatever you want to call it, the TUC, to not back the Stockport Messenger strike. That was a very key strike in the printing industry because it paved the way for Eddie Shah and the breakup of trade union organisations within the printing industry. The defeat of the Stockport Messenger led pretty quickly onto Wapping. The miners' strike was an heroic episode by any, by any means you care to measure it. A heroic episode, and I always found something deeply unpleasant um, about the attitude taken within the higher echelons of the Labour Party and the parliamentary Labour Party towards the miners' strike. My memory of that strike was days and nights spent in rallies, meetings, marches, demonstrations and pickets in support of the miners, getting back to Parliament and hearing these cynics, Labour right-wing MPs, sitting around in the tea room saying, well, Scargill doesn't really understand what's going on, you know. He hasn't understood the situation. He hasn't prepared himself a negotiated settlement a complete and abject refusal to support what was going on in that strike. At the same time, the right in this country, led by Thatcher, but it was, I think it's wrong to characterise the whole thing as Thatcherism and around Thatcher, it was deeper than that, were trying philosophically to change opinions. They were arguing in favour of it doesn't matter what you do, providing you make money out of it. It doesn't matter if you're selling drugs, selling property, selling cars, selling selling poison, selling cigarettes, selling drinks, selling anything, providing you're making money, it's okay. They created the basis of a totally immoral society. And in that, there was a shift of people who frankly should have known better, who were, uh, from their past anyway, their interests and their experience should have known better, gave credibility to these arguments. Think of the way that the performance and the activities of Marxism today all through the 80s and the heroic role that Martin Jakes has played in promoting the far right in this country. And he's still doing it today. And there are, well, of course, I wouldn't want to leave him out for one moment or Maxwell for that matter. Um, and so there was this um, attempt to change attitudes in a popular way by the Tories. And one shouldn't underestimate the single-mindedness and their ability to try to change um, popular attitudes and promote this idea of a sort of greedy devil may care society. The other big factor throughout the 80s was what was happening in Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, and in what we choose to call the Third World, I choose to call, I prefer to call the Southern countries. In Eastern Europe, the contradictions of in many cases imposed one-party states of the bureaucratism of those parties, the suppression of popular trade union activity in those countries led again to um, attacks being made on the principles of communism, the principles of socialism, the principles of many of those things that us in this room would adhere to. That was a, a, a serious factor that I think altered attitudes as well. And latterly, the uh, very rapid decline and demise and breakup of the Soviet Union that happened in the late 80s and early 90s. All these things had an effect. Whilst internationally, the breakup of the Eastern European Soviet Union bloc meant that its influence internationally was changed, its influence was reduced, the power of its international was reduced, and uh, whilst I have um, criticism of what went on, it nevertheless was an important factor in world affairs, the power of that international. That gave an enormous power to the right in world affairs, backed by the Reagan Bush administration, on the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and the power that they imposed upon southern countries to pay debts, to receive inadequate payments for basic commodities, to receive toxic waste, to receive the pollution and environmental destruction of the North industrial countries and helped to polarise the world. And so it was, by all, any way you care to look at it, a pretty dismal decade. There were places where um, great achievements were made in Nicaragua, the changes that happened in South Africa and some other places. But basically it was a decade when um, the power of the right worldwide was something that grew very, very quickly indeed. Now, as one who's been in the Labour Party all my life, 
And I'm in the Labour Party because it receives the mass support of the working class in this country, because it has a trade union link and affiliation, because I believe it is the place where socialists ought to be, ought to be, ought to be organising. Now, there may be differences of opinion about that, but I think it's also important to recognise what was going on in the party at that time. There was a growth of the right, there was a, a leadership under Neil Kinnock, which we're now to hear all the truth about and all the doubts that he apparently had about all the things that he did as leader, for which no doubt the television screen will be turned off around the country when it starts on Sunday week. Um, that leadership sought to give itself much greater power than any other leadership of the party had done, far greater than Wilson or Callaghan did over what was going on within the party. And that leadership also sought to expel people for taking part in what I call serious activities against the Tory government outside Parliament. The attack on comrades in the militant tendency for their activities against the poll tax, the attacks, public attacks on Scargill and the NEO leadership for their performance during the strike, and the large number of parties that suffered expulsions and suspensions during that period. All all in the name of getting the approval of the sort of middle ground um, compromise that the British establishment is always keen to search for. And of course it didn't work, because in the 1987 election it didn't lead to a victory. In the 1992 election it led to a defeat because, I believe, because uh, Many of the poorest people in this country, many unemployed, many pensioners in this country were saying to me and many others, candidates no doubt on the doorstep, fine, we don't want the Tory government, where is the Labour strategy on health, on housing, on education? Where is the Labour strategy on industrial development? Where is the Labour strategy on employment? Why have we changed your mind on nuclear weapons? Well, personally, I didn't take any of these questions in a personal way because I didn't think any of them applied to me, and I did my best to answer them accordingly. But nevertheless, there are issues that have to be addressed. The right undoubtedly gained a great deal of power of the party. One of the problems, only one, are the problems of the power of patronage of the leader within the parliamentary party, but also the power of patronage and the career structure that went within and around the country. But there are always people who are standing up for socialist ideas, irrespective of party. Many of us in this room marched together in support of the Guildford Four, the Birmingham Six, the Tottenham Three, Judith Ward, and very, number, very many other miscarriages of justice cases. They have been absolutely crucial in changing the whole atmosphere of attitudes towards the police and the judicial system in this country. Those were some of the great victories of that period. We've also marched together against the Gulf War, the hideousness of the Gulf War, the vile colonial war that it was, the 300,000 people that were killed, all in the interests of international oil companies. So there are an awful lot of things that unite the left in this country. But the debate that is now going on within the Labour Party about the link with the trade unions and the power of trade union representation in voting at party conference is a very important one. Now, I've had plenty of, plenty of differences with trade union leaderships uh, over the years. I mentioned the miners' strike and other things like that and the role that TUC took. But it's very interesting that the rights in this country, the rights that control much of the media in this country and believe they can lead much, much of political opinion, are very keen to break this trade union link with the Labour Party. But John Smith is not having it all, in, all his own way on this. He suffered defeat after defeat after defeat in trade union conferences on this proposal. I don't know what's going to happen at this year's party conference, but I do believe that there is a real chance that uh, there will be a rejection of the idea of breaking the formal trade union link. And I think that is important, because I believe that trade union link is an important one. The trade unions founded the Labour Party, the trade unions are the basis and the backbone of the Labour Party, and surely, as active socialists, activities in trade unions are just as important as trade unions in political parties. There is also an upsurge of struggle in so many other areas. The campaign against health service cuts and closures, increasing campaigns against environmentally disastrous planning decisions like major roads. There is confusion perhaps, but I think it's beginning to be an understanding of the dangers of the Maastricht Treaty uh, for internationalism and for us 
in the next few years. The Maastricht Treaty I voted against, as did um, some 70 other Labour MPs because of that pressure that's come outside Parliament. Because it imposes management on a whole continent. Because it increases the power of NATO. Because it increases the power of the Common Market Commission. Because it decreases the power of any democratic institutions or trade unions around Europe. But we have to be optimistic. We have to look to some better world. That's why real links between trade unions and socialists, north and south, are very important. Whilst the understanding of the struggle against the debt imposed on uh, poor countries by the International Monetary Fund and banking system is very important. While real solidarity of workers north and south is important. We have much more in common with coal miners in Colombia than we do with the ruling class in Britain. We have much more in common with tea pickers in Sri Lanka than we do with the typhoon company in this country. Those are the issues of international links that have to be made. I believe that the best way forward is by uniting on those issues on which we can unite, uniting on those struggles against racism, internationalism and for peace on which we can unite. I happen to believe that the strategy for activity and organisation is best directed into the Labour Party because it's the party that receives the mass support of the working class. I don't pretend it's always easy in the Labour Party. I don't pretend it's a simple road. And having been secretary of the campaign group and done a lot to try and build up campaign groups locally around the country, I know of those difficulties. But I conclude with this point. It's very easy to develop ourselves into some kind of pure organisation away from the party that does receive the mass support of the working class in this country. That's why I joined the Labour Party over 25 years ago. That's why I'm staying in it, to fight for socialism and fight for socialist ideas which will triumph, which will prevent this world descending into a nuclear holocaust or an environmental disaster. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I will be brief because um, I understand the pressure is closing now for lunchtime, so people obviously need to, got children there to go and pick them up. I thank uh, Eunice for his last speech. I'm actually a vegetarian and have always been a Republican, so... <laughs> <laughs> the, roast, the roast beef question isn't one that troubles me. <laughs> and uh, I do thank the comrades, particularly Sophie, for the vote in the election and for the invitation to join the SWP. I'll, I'll keep the first and I'll put the other one on hold for the moment if I may. Um, I think that there are a lot of serious issues that have to be addressed at the present time in, in Britain and internationally. One of which is the way in which socialist ideas are attempted to be marginalised all the time by the sort of media, by television, by thinkers. It's always outdated communist ideas, outdated socialist ideas, outdated trade union ideas. Whereas the basis of Britain's class-ridden society is much the same as it was at the start of this century. People might all be slightly better off, but the differences between rich and poor are absolutely enormous. And there are, what, six million people living below the European threshold. There are a million people who do not appear on any register as either unemployed, sick, pensioner, or anything else. They get absolutely nothing. And you see some of them sleeping on the streets of London. That is the kind of horrible society that we live in at the present time. And there's a big debate developing now about the future of the welfare state. You know the sort of thing. You get to Frank Field and a Tory minister and a Liberal not talking about whether we should keep universal benefits or those that remain, whether we should have a universally applicable welfare state, but how to dismantle it. We have to get in on that debate and say, we don't accept the demographic argument about pensions. We don't accept the demographic and economic arguments about income support, board and lodging allowances or anything else. We absolutely demand universal, non-means-tested benefits available to everybody with a taxation system that provides for it. Very important debate. We shouldn't run away from that debate. But there is a serious attack being made by the right in a general sense, through education, through the national curriculum, through the control of the media, through the uh, market-orientated lives that so many people lead. Young people working in McDonald's, Wimpy's, sweatshop clothing industry, sweatshop engineering employers, 
and all the rest of it, and often unemployed and on schemes, do not join trade unions. They don't get the chance. If they try to join a trade union, you get the kind of dispute that we've got at Bernstein's at the moment, and there are so many others like that around the country. It's important to get in on the basic argument about trade union membership and the right of trade union membership and the socialist discussion that should go with that. I was disappointed that hardly anyone mentioned international issues during the discussion. Okay, I realise it's quite a short discussion, but I do honestly believe that what's happening internationally, internationalism is a very, very important force. The power of multinational capital that is increased by the GATT agreement the undemocratic nature of the UN, the way the UN has been hijacked by the United States to fight the Gulf War and the rest of it. But we have to also face day-to-day -day questions of our own. Ernie, who's a great friend of mine, indeed he used to be, uh, <clears throat> when, he worked, when he was at the AEU, I was his assistant for some time. I'm a great admirer of Ernie's work. He explained what happens to Labour leaders. When they say the barons of the TUC, they mean the barons of the TUC. He read them all out there. There is a real problem about democracy within the Labour movement, in the trade unions and the Labour Party. I'm in the Labour Party because it has that mass working class support. It doesn't mean that the Labour Party is right all the time or on everything. It doesn't mean Labour governments haven't sold out or indeed might not sell out in the future. But it does mean we've got to take seriously the existence of the party, the structure of the party, the support the party gets, and I believe try to change that party so that we can use it as an instrument to change society. Not everyone in this room is going to agree with that, but I think you will agree that it's important that we build where we can united struggles on trade union issues, on racism, on poverty, on peace, on international solidarity. Those are the key issues of our time. If we abdicate from that debate and abdicate from that struggle, then what are we doing? Leaving the field open to the right to set their agenda, their violent, nasty, divided society. That's what we're against. We all know what we're for. Thank you. Someone sent up a question, or asked a question, saying, who are the other side? Well, it's very simple, comrades. The capitalist class and its instruments, the state, the media, who owns the media, various other bodies, and we have to say also, although the social basis is different, the right wing of the Labour Party and its basis in the trade union bureaucracy. Okay. <laughs> I agree with most of what Jeremy Corbyn said about the heat. But he made one point that really needs a bit of developing. Two sentences. Yes, look, 81, Mitron, Ben Gonzalez, Ben Papandreou. Now, any one of them could have been a villain, couldn't they? Yet every one of them, every single one, once in office, reversed their policies and pursued policies, particularly in the Mitron case, if anything more extreme than factors. Now that can't be a question of a personal defect in every case, can it? There can be rotten apples in any barrel. The whole bloody barrel's rotten, and that is the case. There's something wrong with the barrel, i.e. the method. And the method is the so-called parliamentary vote for socialism. Well, we're not opposed to participation in Parliament. Oh, we can be with it. I wish we were strong enough to have some representation. We're not. It's a pity we have to change it. But we are opposed to the illusion that you can change part the, you can change the social system by parliamentary means from the top. That's the basic thing, and unfortunately, I'm not particularised about the comrades on the platform here. Most of the left in the Labour Party still believe. So, of course, do the mass of working people who want to change things. Right? But we cannot base ourselves, you take up all the points that Ernie made, that's not the present consciousness of the working class. We can't base ourselves on that. We have to see ways and means to change that consciousness by intervention, by activity, by a paper. You know, it's a paradox that this mass party of the working class, uh, which at one time is, is or the day who are actually controlled by the General Council of the TUC, and in the height of the Benard thing, or 
near our backside. They set up, we clean and all, but actually they we clean. I mean, given the ratio of so they don't have a day, but a week is a step forward. What happened to it? Down the blood hole. Now, we, small, etc., etc., is we managed to produce a weekly paper, and not just to produce it, but to sell it energetically, precisely because of the battle of ideas. Now, there's one thing I have to disagree with, Jeremy uh, Corbyn, and I'll be brief about it. The whole question of the USSR, Eastern Europe, and so on. Now, the truth is, these regimes were Stalinist regimes, were in no sense socialist, were in fact despotism over the working class and not instruments of working class rule. It's quite true, of course, the media go to town and stuff, and the socialism and so on and so forth. But of course, of course, that's something you said we have to combat. And the basic way, the only effective way of combating it is to say, look, socialism, self emancipation of the working class, means that all the working people and their families run society, take the decisions and so on. Was that true? Under Brezhnev, under his successors and so on, absolute rubbish, absolute rubbish. Now we have always had this position, unfortunately, many other people have had illusions, all right. Actually, the end of history, remember, proved that was short show. <laughs> and the new, the new world order, look at it, look at it. No, I have time to, to elaborate that. I'm, I'm going to finish on the fundamental point, which is this. So, both, all the speakers on the platform accept that we need to develop the broadest unity in struggle on this, that, or the other issue, and we go say, you're something, so we don't want you. No, you support. Campaign against the polls, campaign against tax and so on. We don't ask you any voters at the last election. Come and do this. We support that and so on and so on. We have to develop a broadest unity. Yes! But we also have to understand that a continuing struggle against the right inside the labour movement, which is a precondition for fighting capitalism as such, unfortunately. I wish it wasn't so, but it is so. Look at the, the miners' strike, look at the pit closures, look at targets, etc. To do that, you require an organisation. Ernie Roberts knows this as well as any better than most, right? For years and years and years, he was in the broad left in the AU, and before the broad left was set up, I can remember, he was president of the Commons District at the time. Right, and the CP wasn't keen on broad left at that time. Nevertheless, attempting an organized struggle against the right in the union. The union you happen to be in. Now then, let's see what that has always depended on. I'll tell you what it's always depended on. It has always depended on an organization outside the Labour Party. And Ernie knows this as well as I do. The broad left depended organisationally and otherwise on the CP. Not that the CP ever constituted a majority of its supporters, very far from it, but the CP was a core of the Good, the CP's disintegrated, it's gone down the plug hole. And personally I say, well there are losses as a result of that, many good people, not just the Martin James, but many good people. But at the end of the day, disappearance of the CP.